I've been working on formulating my Mac Studio review for a couple of weeks, and I've finally been able to spend enough time with the machine to share my thoughts about Apple's most powerful desktop offering. Now, I've had the opportunity to test both the high-end Mac Studio with the M1 Ultra system on a chip, along with the entry-level M1 Max base model. Is the Mac Studio a worthwhile purchase for those looking for a desktop solution? Should you splurge for the M1 Ultra? Watch my hands-on video walkthrough as I share my observations and findings and be sure to subscribe to 9to5Mac on YouTube for more Mac Studio related videos. In terms of design, the Mac Studio is pretty much the definition of an overcorrection. Its beefy chassis, which is nearly the size of three Mac Minis stacked on top of each other, is neither pretty nor elegant. Contrary to past approaches, Apple designed the computer by first determining what users needed in terms of performance and capability and sculpted the machine around those parameters. The Mac Studio isn't an ugly machine, but it's a clear departure from Johnny I's vision of what a desktop computer should look like and frankly, that's a breath of fresh air. That's not to say that the Mac Studio doesn't have its thoughtfully designed areas either. For example, the unit is just short enough so that it fits safely underneath Apple's newly launched 27-inch Studio display. It also features a beautifully designed intake and exhaust system. And while the Mac Studio isn't dead silent, it's quiet enough to where you'll need to put forth some effort to actually hear it, even when it's under considerable load. Outside of the Mac Pro, the Mac Studio is the only computer that Apple makes with more than four USB-C ports. On the M1 Ultra version of the machine, all of the USB-C ports are Thunderbolt 4 ports, which proves to be extremely handy for someone like me who is steep knee deep in the Thunderbolt ecosystem. The cheaper M1 Max enabled Mac Studios lack the necessary bandwidth to have six Thunderbolt ports, relegating the front two ports to 10 gigabits per second USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports instead. Now for me, that's a little bit disappointing, but for the majority of people, four Thunderbolt 4 ports plus two USB 3.1 ports provides more than enough USB-C I.O. Next to the two front facing USB-C ports is a UHS-2 enabled SDXC card slot. This is a perfect addition for those who regularly offload photos and videos from digital cameras. And although SD cards aren't nearly as fast as something like CF Express, which is a storage medium that many modern cameras are starting to use, SD cards remain far more prevalent. Even some of the newest cameras that capture 8K video support shooting directly to an SD card. Now I've recently been testing out Canon's R5C hybrid mirrorless camera, and it features an updated H HEVC codec, which has a very reasonable 540 megabits per second data rate. Now, such a data rate happens to be perfect for V90 SD cards. In fact, card manufacturer Wise just announced a V90 offering that maxes out at 512 gigabytes, which is the largest such V90 card yet, and one capable of storing up to two hours of 8K video captured with the R5C. Stay tuned because in an upcoming post and video, I'm gonna be discussing why the R5C is such an amazing camera and an ideal Mac Studio companion. Now, you wouldn't be crazy to think that you were looking at the back of an Intel Mac Mini when looking at the rear of the Mac Studio because outside of the arrangement of the ports, the type of I.O. is very similar. Mac Studio features four Thunderbolt 4 slash USB 4 ports on the rear, a 10 gigabit Ethernet port, two USB-A ports, an HDMI 2.0 port, and a 3.5 millimeter headphone output. But unlike the Mac Mini, 10 gigabit Ethernet comes standard on all Mac Studio machines, which is great for connecting to things like NAS boxes or even something like Blackmagic Design's newly introduced Cloud Store box. While it's not as fast as Thunderbolt, 10 gigabit Ethernet is a lot more flexible. It can travel over longer distances and whole networks can be designed around it. Now, in my case, I have my Mac Studio connected to a 10 gigabit Ethernet switch, a Synology NAS with 10 gigabit Ethernet card, and a 5 gigabit per second AT&T fiber internet connection. Now, what's great is that all these network components reside in another area of the house away from my office, meaning that I don't have to worry about the noise emanating from the Synology NAS when a time machine backup decides to run, for instance. Of course, I can't forget to mention one of the biggest I.O. benefits of the Mac Studio when compared to M1 based machines. The M1 Mac Mini, for instance, supported just one Thunderbolt display up to 6K resolution, while the Mac Studio supports four 6K Pro Display XDRs or 5K Studio displays simultaneously. In all, the Mac Studio supports five displays at once if you also count its ability to connect to a 4K display via HDMI. Pretty impressive. 
Now I've tested both the base model Mac Studio and a much beefier M1 Ultra model featuring a 20 core CPU, 64 core GPU, 128 gigabytes of unified memory, and one terabyte SSD. Now I have lots of thoughts about both of these machines, but one of the talking points you'll likely hear around the tech world is how the M1 Ultra is a relatively bad value. This talking point rings roughly true in some areas. For example, 95 Max Miles Somerville put both machines to the test for video editing and found that while the M1 Ultra yielded slightly better export and render times in Final Cut Pro, the differences for his workflows weren't nearly commensurate to the $2,000 plus price difference. But here's where it gets interesting. Like anything, different needs and different workflows will determine whether or not you should upgrade any of the build to order parts when configuring a Mac Studio. Here are my main observations after testing these two machines back to back, spoken primarily from a video editor's perspective, but also touching on other areas. First and foremost, I'm really glad that Apple opted to give users 32 gigabytes of unified memory as a starting point. 16 gigabytes is just not enough memory for a desktop computer these days, and you'll quickly start running out of memory and swapping out to a much slower SSD with just a few apps open. And if you edit video, especially higher resolution 6K or 8K workflow, you'll start swapping out to disk as soon as you open some Final Cut projects. It's really ridiculous. So 32 gigabytes is a very good thing. Now, with all that being said, I believe 64 gigabytes of unified memory is the sweet spot if you can A, afford the upcharge and B, can wait weeks or perhaps months due to back orders on build to order configs. Now, I've long noted that storage is really the only thing on modern Apple computers that's quote unquote upgradable because of the existence of Thunderbolt connectivity. In the past, I was quick to dismiss internal storage storage upgrades due to how costly they were when compared to mid-tier external media. But depending on the type of work you do, internal storage upgrades are an area that should not really be overlooked on Apple Silicon. If you're regularly working with huge files, think 3D rendering, high resolution video editing, etc., then you might consider upgrading internal storage if you can afford it. Now, I don't think most people truly appreciate how utterly fast Apple's internal storage is and how much of an impact it can have on overall system performance when working working with large swaths of data. Not only does a larger SSD help from the perspective of just being able to store more files, I don't think enough people truly appreciate how ridiculously fast Apple's internal storage is and how much of an impact it can have on overall system performance when working with large swaths of data. Not only does a larger SSD help from the perspective of you know just being able to store more files, but the drive gets faster as the size increases as well. At any rate, the speed of Apple's internal storage will more time than not run circles around external media. Even most Thunderbolt SSDs won't really be able to compete unless you delve into some of the really expensive NVMe based RAID setups. And comparatively, Apple's $2,400 asking price for its top end eight terabyte SSD is fairly competitive. Now, if you haven't noticed, the machines that Apple uses to benchmark the Mac Studio's ability to handle multiple streams of 8K ProRes video feature eight terabytes of spec'd out storage. I don't believe that this is a coincidence because brutally fast storage is essential when you're moving over a dozen and a half streams of 8K video at the same time. Now, Apple notes that the Mac Studio configured with the M1 Ultra can play back an insane 18 streams of 8K ProRes 422 video at the same time. And although my Mac Studio has the necessary CPU and GPU credentials, the one terabyte of storage seemed to serve as a bottleneck causing the last four streams of 8K video to drop frames on playback below real-time levels in my testing. While it's true that basic video workflows won't see huge gains when upgrading to the higher spec version of the Mac Studio, trudging through more demanding work such as editing feature-length films with multiple streams of 8K video will definitely benefit from the more powerful build-to-order configurations. There's also the matter of machine learning tasks, which apps like Final Cut Pro are becoming more reliant on. The M1 Ultra with its 32 core neural engine will be able to execute operations like motion tracking and new voice isolation features in Final Cut Pro even faster. But obviously I'm kind of living in a bubble here. The, the Mac Studio wasn't just made for video. Application developers will benefit from reduced compile times made possible by that 20 core CPU in the M1 Ultra. While training ML models using platforms like TensorFlow stand to benefit from the additional GPU cores as well. And although these are far from my areas of expertise, I was able to see tangible benefits when running tests across both disciplines. Now, assuming your work translates to Apple Silicon, the following people should consider purchasing the Mac Studio. Number one, Mac Mini users looking for more I.O. and power. Two, Mac Pro users looking for more power. 
which is kind of crazy to say. And then three, other Apple users looking for an always own desktop solution. Even the base Mac Studio is a great overall computer and a massive, massive step up in usability over any M1 Mac that Apple sells. It features way more IO than any other of the Apple Silicon powered laptops or desktop options. It runs quieter than any of the company's laptops and it features relatively generous specs for the 1999 base model. Now, one of the main downsides of the Mac Studio is that like the Mac Mini, you'll need to already own a display or purchase a display. Of course, this unit pairs perfectly with Apple's new 27 inch studio display, but that adds another $15.99 on top of the purchase price. Now, if such a scenario is a non-starter, but you're still looking to upgrade to Apple Silicon, uh, you may consider the M1 Pro 14 inch MacBook Pro, which is a very capable laptop that features a screen outside of the size that is actually better than a studio display in several tangible ways. Either that or wait for the cheaper M2 powered Mac mini arriving later this year. That should have more IO as well. And of course, more power. Now, whereas the Mac mini serves as more of a niche product, the Mac studio is extremely usable on pretty much all fronts. Just add a display, keyboard, and mouse, and you're good to go. I just wish it came in black because it will look a lot less awkward that way, in my opinion. What do you think about the Mac Studio? Have you purchased one or plan on purchasing one? Sound off down below in the comments with your thoughts. Be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more videos like this and check out some of these other Mac Studio videos as well. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac.